Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Mariam Golnarogi, and I'm the Director of Climate Change and Environment at the Geneva Association. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this strategic discussion on future-proofing technological innovations for a resilient net zero economy, which is organized by the Geneva Association and the OECD. Today's agenda will include an opening remark. Uh, I will offer a short context and objectives, followed by a keynote by Patricia Spinoza, Executive Secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. This event includes two panel discussions. First panel is on scaling up new technological uh, uh, developments towards net zero. After a short break, we will move to a CEO panel, which explores role of insurers in de-risking and investing in new climate tech for decarbonization, with a stage setting remarks by Mr. Nagano, chairman of Tokyo Marine Holdings. Before we pro uh, proceed, let me give you a few housekeeping points. Participants are muted by default. During Q&A of panels one and two, you can submit written questions or use the raise hand function to pose your questions in person. This event is being recorded and the recording will be available soon on the conference website of the Geneva Association. With no further delay, I would like to invite Charles Brindamore, CEO of Intact Financial and chairman of the board of the Geneva Association uh, to present, to offer his opening remarks. Charles, over to you, thank you. Great. Thank you, Marianne, and uh, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, morning, evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really pleased to welcome everyone to this very timely discussion and to highlight the role that the insurance industry can play in supporting tech innovations, but more importantly, in my mind, to contributing to a resilient net zero economy. As insurers, as you probably know, we've been on the front line of the consequences of climate change for decades. Indeed, as early as 25 years ago, our ability to protect homes and businesses faced an existential threat from an increasing burden of natural disasters. The industry has had to rethink itself in terms of data, predictive tools, products, service model, as well as its supply chains. But in the face of adversity, we really had to reinvent ourselves to survive and grow. And it's with that history of transformation that I really think our industry can help power and shape the transition to a net zero world. But the challenge is massive for society. And we're convinced that to succeed, focus, and then alignment between all pillars and layers of society will be essential. And it's with that spirit in mind that we're thrilled to host leaders, not only from the insurance and finance industry, but also the United Nations, the OECD, the World Economic Forum, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and so on. All of us, are here to talk in practical terms about the technological innovations necessary to help us get to net zero. And our conversations today will help to shape the discussions at COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland in a few weeks. So climate is an opportunity to both help society and capture opportunities in the marketplace in my mind. For insurers and most private participants, climate should be a strategy, not just ESG or disclosure. The transition to net zero and the ongoing consequences of climate change will affect how people live for decades to come. It is the deeper trend of this century and responsible business leaders should see this transition as the most important opportunity of the coming decades. That's certainly how I see it. I think insurers 
can provide foundational expertise to help combat the challenges of climate change. We can be a key agent in de-risking the transition towards a sustainable future by leveraging our strengths and expertise in data analytics, in pricing, in risk management, as well as prevention. We also, and it's very important to realize that we have ongoing relationships and communications with billions of customers globally, where we engage on risk management and prevention. Integrating a responsible carbon footprint mindset in these interactions can, in my mind, really move the needle. And finally, it goes without saying that with trillions of investments on our balance sheets, we can also invest in industries in transition and in those being created to support the transition. We've historically played a key role in enabling innovation and prosperity in all areas of the economy. These competitive advantages mean that insurers can offer, in my mind, a meaningful contribution to society as we transform industries and customer behaviors. But the bigger and more complex question in my mind is how can private capital and insurers work with other parts of society to create real momentum? Because as I mentioned earlier, it is a massive societal challenge. And so I think it's important to understand that governments actually are the designated drivers on the road to net zero. Governments have a powerful role to play to shape the agenda and steer private capital and consumers towards this agenda. So what are some of the critical elements of a good roadmap? And I see three. The first one is priorities need to be clear. Too often I've been sitting in discussions on climate uh, you know, with lots of vague ambitions and a whirlwind of ideas. And I would say in my experience, it's been extraordinarily difficult for government to establish a focused agenda, one that we can concentrate on over time. And so setting priorities is key to the success in my mind. Secondly, then government behaviors should be consistent with their intentions and priorities. Governments are powerful and can send very strong signals to private participants. But climate priorities need to be consistently translated across governmental action. Both the legislative agenda, spending, procurement, taxation, regulatory activity, as well as government imposed incentives and penalties. There needs to be a connection between the dots. There needs to be some degree of consistency. Otherwise, private capital is confused and is not operating at the speed it could to move the needle. And thirdly, public capital investments needs to be directed towards future-proofing critical infrastructure and accelerating clean growth. It's not one or the other, we think it's both. There are unique risks in clean technology that private capital can't take on its own. Governments can help mitigate risks by supplying new capital and removing regulatory barriers to speed up the development of clean solutions. Also, as the consequence of climate change continue to rage, three out of four dollars of natural disasters is actually borne by the public. And so it's critical that as part of this investment uh, process for government, that we accelerate investment in future-proofing critical infrastructure. It is not either or, uh, as far as I'm concerned. So let me end my remarks by driving home the importance of our work today in ensuring that we come up with solutions we can actually translate into concrete actions. The world is not short on good ideas, but focus and intensity in action are essential to today's success. And on that note, thank you. And I look forward to a fruitful outcome of these discussion. And I'll hand over to Jeffrey Schlagenhoff, Deputy Secretary General of the OECD.
Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a great pleasure to be with you today to discuss a topic that is of critical importance to the world and to the OECD. Is the latest report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change clearly brings home, climate change is underway and accelerating. The earth is experiencing unprecedented scale of extreme weather events, heat, waves, floods, and wildfires. These are occurring against a backdrop of slow onset changes, including rising seas, changing climatic patterns, and ocean acidification. It is now apparent that climate tipping points may be triggered at lower levels of warming than previously thought, with potentially devastating global consequences. It is a clear warning message that we should all act now to move into a low carbon future as pledged in the Paris Agreement. The OECD work supports international efforts on climate action with a focus on enhancing societal and economic resilience, improving productivity, and reducing inequality. Our members reaffirmed their commitment last week at our ministerial council meetings chaired by the United States to make this a decade of action on climate. This commitment was enshrined in our OECD vision for the next decade where our members commit to prioritizing resilience and energy transition and to supporting countries in their just transition towards net zero greenhouse gas emissions. We also hope that next month's discussions at COP26 will continue this momentum. Technology and innovation, a key theme for this conference, will play a critical role in supporting the transition to net zero providing the world with the solutions needed to reduce our dependence on carbon intensive modes of production and consumption. The insurance sector in its roles as underwriter, risk manager and investor can greatly help support the necessary technological transformation. Let me touch on a few ways and conference speakers will no doubt elaborate on these further. Insurers can provide insurance products that mitigate risk for investors in new technologies such as renewables, while also providing important de-risking solutions for infrastructure development more generally. Also, in their portfolio investors, insurers can allocate capital to climate investments that correspond with their risk appetite, return horizon, and liquidity preferences. Capital markets can help reduce investment risks for instance, through unlisted infrastructure investment funds that pool different projects. The regulatory and supervisory framework for insurance companies will have implications for the ability of insurance companies to play a role in addressing climate challenges and managing climate related risk. And many regulators and supervisors are examining how their oversight affects the achievement of climate targets. For example, in September, as part of the review of the Solvency II Directive, the European Commission mandated European Insurance and Occupational Pensions Authority, EIOPA, to review the prudential treatment of assets associated with climate objectives, a welcome step in furthering this important discussion. The OECD joined forces with the Geneva Association to organize today's event with the goal to bring together public and private sector perspectives and to build the necessary synergies. I hope that the discussion today will help to promote a better understanding of the issues and we can define ways in which policymakers can work closely with the insurance industry to address climate related challenges. I am certain that the outcomes of the discussion today will feed into discussion at the OECD and help to define a future agenda on insurance and climate. Thank you very much for the opportunity to join you. And I'd now like to pass the floor back to Mary. Thank you very much, uh, Charles. Thank you, DSG Schlangenhoff. And uh, with uh, uh, now we will move on to the rest of the conference. Uh, before we start, I would like to make a few statements about uh, some of our uh, findings um, about this area to put this conference into context. Uh, 
if you can please put up my slides uh, so that I can uh, do this briefing. Thank you very much. Um, achieving decarbonization targets over the next few decades requires a well-planned whole of economy approach. This will require an unprecedented transformation across all sectors, requiring deployment of new technologies, new processes, and new infrastructure systems. Our ability to expand the scope, scale, and our agility to deploy viable technologies, which in this conference I refer to as climate tech, are critical to expanding the pace of disruptive transformation that's needed in energy, food and agriculture, water, mobility, and, and so on. Now, our research on the state of climate tech across nine major sectors has revealed a number of interesting, interesting trends. On the supply side of climate tech, there are four major trends. There is increasing coordinated funding sources and platform to inject funds at different stages uh, of technological pathways from early stages of innovation to scale deployment. Secondly, investors are engaging in different stages of technology supply chain depending on their risk return profiles. What we are finding is governments are increasingly investing in not only just early research and innovation, but also technology de development and then large scale deployment through sustainable infrastructure systems. But there is very interesting trend in the private sector where we are seeing rising number of venture capitalists, the high risk, high return VCs, a new asset class, corporate venture capital, and an interesting, very large investor led funds such as Bill Gates breakthrough energy ventures. And now there is a new breed of financing that's converging through marriage of venture capital and those that traditionally have been financing large projects, particularly pension funds. And a lot of that is in deployment of large projects. Traditionally, focus, in, focus of innovation has been on alternatives for energy generations and carbon capture, but we are seeing a clear trend in investments towards new climate tech for food and agriculture, mobility, water, consumer goods, and heavy industries like cement, metal, and so on. And then there is a very clear shift in, in moving from small scale pilot to large scale deployment of solar, wind, CCS in form of new infrastructure and large scale projects. Now on the demand side, adoption of new tech uh, through new business model and infrastructure systems, there is clear two major trends that demand is on the rise by companies and governments linked to their decarbonization plans, and then also the post-COVID spending for economic recovery. We are also seeing emerging user clusters and hubs from different sectors coming together to identify technological needs for achieving net zero. And we are very happy to have two of those hubs, the World Economic Forum Mission Possible uh, Partnership, as well as the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. Uh, a lot of um, development on large scale deployment. Now, how can we expedite this? What challenges need to be addressed and how? Uh, next slide, please. Now, for that, essentially, we see a number of key challenges um, from public policy and a related instrument that needs to uh, enable these areas, both from the point of view of in, in increasing supply but also creating a demand. Um, furthermore, role of um, directing sustainable financing uh, towards scaling up development and deployment of climate tech. And this is also linked to taxonomies and regulations associated with sustainable finance. We will have a good discussion today around why we need to rethink financing of net zero and to that extent um, as a, a technologies and then very importantly, the focus of our conversation today is new technologies come with myriad of new untested risks, such as operational and safety risk, environmental and disposal risk, construction risk, market risk, professional mistakes, et cetera, that have not been tested. So how can insurers 
step in and work with technologists, engineering firms, and others to actually price and allocate and better manage risks. And this is something that we will really discuss today. So objective of our conversation today is threefold. The developments needed to achieve uh, net zero role of insurers and reinsurers in the risking and financing technological pathways from early stage all the way to large scale deployment and the partnerships that are needed to be forged and strengthened to enable this. So with that, I would like to move to a, a message by Patricia Spinoza, uh, Secretary, uh, Executive Secretary of UNFCCC. As you know, last week, uh, the early stage of negotiations took place in Italy, uh, where 56 governments came together in a pre-COP um, negotiation discussion. Uh, unfortunately, this weekend, we were informed that Patricia has been called into meetings for pre-COP26 and could not physically be available at the time of this conference. Patricia has recorded a message for us over the weekend and sent it over. And I would like to ask uh, our conference unit to play this message for us before we get into our panel discussions. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to address this important discussion which is instrumental as we work towards COP26 in our mutual efforts to address the risks of climate change throughout the world. While several differences exist with respect to the nature of our organizations, we also have much in common. For example, our organizations must separate ourselves from the noisy world of partisanship and deal with accurate, measurable data. We're mutually dependent on facts, science, evidence, and evaluation of risk. We understand the value of preventive measures to ensure long-term stability. Ultimately, we want a planet that is healthy, safe, resilient, and sustainable one that is prosperous over time in all senses of the term. Our paths converge at the Paris Agreement. UN Climate Change recognizes that reaching the objectives of the Paris Agreement is furthered by preempting risk, planning for it, and helping nations and people establish contingency arrangements, including insurance, to build climate resilience. As a preeminent industry dealing in risk, you are at the center of this work. Perhaps no other industry has your unique insights into the impacts and repercussions of our climate emergency. Certainly, few others better understand the economic repercussions of the increased frequency and severity of extreme weather disasters. The science tells us that if we do not urgently change course, these repercussions will intensify. The recent report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change showed that unless there are rapid, sustained and large-scale reductions of greenhouse gas emissions, the Paris Agreement goal of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees will be increasingly difficult to reach. The NDC synthesis report and assessment of all national climate action plans showed that under our current path, temperatures could rise to 2.7 degrees, which will have devastating results for humanity. Numbers and statistics inform the work of both our organization. But the true impact of climate change is measured in human terms. Recently, India, North America, and some areas in Central Asia have experienced life-threatening extreme heat levels never experienced before by the human species. As science and experience makes painfully clear, every fraction of increase in temperature poses catastrophic risks to nature upon which we depend. We urgently need to get off our deadly path 
of high emissions and make the transition towards a more resilient and sustainable future. We must get on a net zero emissions path. This is easier said than done. The public and private sector continue to struggle to manage the risks and uncertainty of this transition. Many vulnerable countries and people also struggle to afford tools like climate risk insurance. I recognize many throughout the insurance industry are working hard to enable and facilitate access to mainstream finance that will help drive the transition to net zero and build resilience among people at high risk of climate impacts. The question we must ask ourselves, and this is true of every sector of the economy, every area of government and every international organization, is whether we are taking action at the scale and pace that is necessary to overcome the threat posed by climate change. Recently, I read an interview with someone in your sector who said that the insurance industry cannot solve climate change. Perhaps it may surprise you to hear that I agree, but I agree only to the extent that it is not the job of any one sector or any one nation or any one person to address climate change. All sectors and all people must play a part and that includes the insurance industry. I want to emphasize that the person being interviewed recognized the importance of addressing climate change and was talking about how the role of the industry must address volatility in general. But I do believe the insurance industry can play a more significant and direct role in the transition to a decarbonized net zero economy. First, as managers of large corporations, the insurance industry can help ensure that its individual activities are consistent with the collective goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. In my position, I hear a lot of good intentions and good speeches from both the public and private sector. What I would dearly like to see more of is solid, measurable actions backing those words. The mobilization of the 100 billion from developed nations to developing under the Paris Agreement is but one example of several examples. As the OECD reported, we're likely only 80% of the way there. Nations must make up the difference rapidly. It's all about establishing trust. We need leadership by example. Second, as insurers and reinsurers of economic activities in every sector, we call upon the industry to de-risk and redirect its coverage of major greenhouse gas emitting industries to renewable energy. As I recently told a group of investors, doing otherwise is like taking one step forward and then two back. Colleagues, you cannot hedge your bets that fossil fuels are a good long-term investment. That leads me to my third point. As investors, I encourage you to underwrite only those portfolios that are consistent with the goals of the Paris Agreement. Again, anything else is a bad investment in the future. These are three suggestions, but three tall orders. Just like a few nations alone cannot address climate change, a few insurance agencies alone cannot turn the tide for your particular industry. We need all insurance companies to embrace these values and contribute to this common cause. For a long time, private sector climate action has been framed in terms of sacrifice. But as your industry itself has noted, 
this may be the greatest economic transformation in history and one with enormous potential for growth in your industry. I truly believe that those who are willing to drive this transformation are at the forefront of one of the most significant economic revolutions in history. But unlike previous economic revolutions, it will not happen solely as a result of market forces. It will require deliberate, directed efforts to leave behind industries and activities that have proved harmful to our environment and are threatening our very lives. These are not easy decisions to make, but they are absolutely necessary to the long-term health of your businesses and to the planet as a whole. Colleagues, those are the changes we need to see at a broad level, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts on them. There are more specific items I look forward to hearing about at this particular forum as well. I want to hear more about ways your work can help countries enhance ambition in mitigation and adaptation. I want to hear how your work assessing, pricing, sharing and allocating climate change risks will unlock a new scale of climate finance. And I want to hear how your important work will rapidly help countries scale up implementation of efforts that will massively mitigate greenhouse gas emissions and help countries adapt to the profound changes ahead. Colleagues, we are asking a lot of your industry. But this climate emergency asks for an unprecedented human response. I leave you with this thought. While it's numbers-based, I believe it shows the human face of our struggle as well. Scientists anticipate that children born this year will have to face between two and seven times more extreme climate-related events over their lifetimes than people born in 1960. And they're going to experience conditions that older generations rarely, if ever, experienced. We must ask ourselves if we are willing to live with this risk. We must ask ourselves if we are willing to just stand in the shadows of the status quo while this gets worse. If the answer is no, I encourage you to help drive this transition towards a net zero future. I encourage you to ensure your activities are consistent with the collective goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I encourage you to redirect your coverage to renewable energy. And I encourage you to underwrite only those portfolios that are consistent with the goals of the Paris Agreement. We share much in common, but nothing more important than our reliance upon the long-term stability, health, resilience, and sustainability of this planet. I look forward to working with you to protect it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And in a discussion with Patricia just before this event, she's very much looking forward to the outcome of discussions and the work that follows uh, over the next uh, years in this area. Uh, Anyway, thank you so much for your patience. I already see that some questions are emerging. Uh, Just to all the participants, please submit your questions either in writing or as we enter the panels, raise your hand and the moderator of the panel will call on you. I do see a question that is more fit for the panel discussion, so I will wait till uh, we enter the panels. Uh, So with that, it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, John Scott, Head of Sustainability Risk at Zurich Insurance Group, who will moderate the first panel, which is on scaling up new technologies towards net zero. John, over to you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Marion. And uh, welcome, everyone, to the first panel. 
Um, we're going to split this into a couple of uh, sessions. The first of all, we're going to have a couple of people setting the stage for us. And I'm delighted to introduce to you Carlotta Perez. Uh, Carlotta is a, a professor of economics, uh, specializing in technology. Uh, she works at both UCL in the UK and also the University of Sussex. Uh, and I can think of no one better to help us think through uh, the implications of technological revolutions uh, and, and uh, uh, to really think through, well, what, how would we achieve the low carbon transition over the next three decades and meet the Paris Agreement goals? So Carlotta, can I please ask you to uh, give us some insights on that topic? Thank you for this opportunity to address this conference. My role is going to be to look above the situation we're in, not just to look at the green transformation, which is enormous, but to the whole set of changes that are forcing us to make even further changes in order to have a decent future. So the question is, is this green transformation a revolution rather than evolution? Well, my answer is yes, it is. And not only in technology, not only across the economy, but we also need an institutional revolution. You might be surprised about that, but we actually need to change the whole set, the whole set of, the whole context which defines how markets work and in which direction they work. What we need is to actually tilt the playing field, keep it even but tilted for all towards smart, green and fair growth. We need the three goals. We need information revolution, green and inequality to combat inequality, what is bringing us so much populism, so much resentment, so many migrations and so many tensions. We must enable profitable innovation and investment in synergistic directions, counting on a sustainable and stable context. Yes, a stable context. We have to be sure that that's the direction in which everything goes so that we can actually move from short-term investment to long-term investment. We need to transform society and you don't do that with short-term little bits. So why both technological and institutional? It's because midway along their diffusion, all technological revolutions have required an institutional transformation too. So we have gone in every case, every one of the previous four revolutions has gone from a gilded bubble prosperity where we have the technological revolution and growing inequality because it's as Schumpeter said, creative destruction. Then we have a bubble or two crashing and certain all sorts of problems that bring, bring recession, political unrest and populism. And then we have the golden ages, the golden age prosperity, which involves an institutional revolution and a win-win game in society. We had canal mania followed by the Great British Leap. Railway mania was far, followed by the Victorian boom. The global booms of the Gilded Age in, in the Southern Hemisphere, Argentina, Australia, and uh, everywhere in the South and in the US were followed by the Belle Epoque and the Progressive, the progressive Era. The Roaring Twenties were followed by the post-war Golden Age the dot-com boom global casino of the past decades could be perhaps followed by a sustainable global ACT golden age. Will it? It's up to us. The golden ages have resulted from a major policy redesign that provides directionality and leads to overall productivity growth and a more balanced society. This whole no productivity. And this is typical of these periods, of the installation periods. The sustained productivity growth that really lifts the whole of society up comes in the golden ages. So why now? Is this the real moment when we have to do it? Well, it is very much the real moment. 
we face a historic opportunity to reshape the system for a better world for all. We are at the confluence of three critical moments. One of them is, as I just showed you, the turning point of the ICT revolution. It is time for social sustainability and for stable growth. So we already had that problem. We already have the need to reshape that. But then we also have the climate threat, which comes, of course, from the way the previous revolution was because the mass production revolution was based mainly on fossil fuels and materials. It was an energy intensive, uh, materials intensive paradigm, which brought many of the problems we have now, but it brought us a great golden age before and lifted a whole range of people to good living. So the climate threat brings us the urgency of environmental sustainability. And we have another one, which is the post-pandemic reconstruction, which has brought us a very important thing. It has brought us consensus on public action. It has made us also understand that if a pandemic can create such havoc, imagine what it would be if we had climate change. This was a global pandemic. Well, we're going to have a global catastrophe if we don't face climate change. And we are now beginning to understand it thanks to the pandemic, but also thanks to the fires and the floods and all the things that have been happening in one place of the world and another. So this conjunction of these three forces, which are all urgent, which are intertwined, make us see that it's time to face them jointly and boldly. How do we do that? By changing the context towards smart, green, fair, and global growth, as I told you before, designing the institutional equivalent of Bretton Woods in breadth and depth, and that means supranational institutions, it means uh, a sort of welfare state, a modern one, not the old one, we've got to change. Practically every policy needs to change creating a far-reaching change in the economic context, that means taxes, subsidies, regulations, laws, et cetera, reaching a radically new consensus and change in the behavior of all actors. And that includes also lifestyles, everybody personally to change, but not to change to a, to a sacrifice sort of thing. No, an aspiration on the best lifestyle is going to be the one that's based on services, information, health, nutrition, and all those things. Uh, managing massive private and public investment in converging directions. We really need these investments to go towards a new green prosperity. Assessing, allocating, and managing risk in the major new opportunities, of course, you all know what that means because the sector with the greatest interest in accelerating the change is precisely the insurance industry. A positive sum game between business, society, and the planet is that they are ready to be unleashed. Let's do it. Thank you. Great, Thank, thanks Carlotta, uh, inspirational words there. So we're also joined by Leonardo Martinez Diaz, uh, Leo is uh, currently the Senior Director for Climate Finance and John Kerry, the Special U.S. Uh, Presidential Envoy for Climate. Uh, Leo also had uh, previous roles uh, during, the, uh, uh, during the Obama administration in uh, the Department of Energy and the Environment within Treasury, uh, and actually is also author of a book called Building a Resilient Tomorrow, How to Prepare for the Coming Climate Disruption. So I can't think of anyone better, Leo, than you to talk us through about what some of the key challenges and opportunities are for government in promoting or incentivizing you know, this technological innovation and disruption and this revolution that uh, Carlotta has talked about. Thank you so much for uh, letting me address uh, this group and uh, to follow uh, on Carlotta's uh, big picture reflections. Look, from our perspective, uh, the challenge is, uh, is increasingly clear and simple, uh, at least to formulate. One is that we must uh, cut emissions uh, by about half this decade, the critical decade of the 2020s, uh, and we need to then quickly uh, decarbonize and reach net zero by 2050. Uh, if we cannot do this, uh, we are looking really at a diminished future uh, for us and for future generations. Uh, and uh, obviously, a very 
uh, difficult environment for business, including an increasingly uninsurable uh, world. What we are doing uh, from the U.S. government standpoint, from the administration, uh, is uh, a couple of things. One, of course, very important was the nationally determined contribution that we submitted earlier this year, which commits the United States to cutting our emissions uh, by between 50 and 52 uh, percent by 2030, uh, and then uh, to including uh, decarbonization of the energy sector uh, by 2035. Uh, we're also increasingly looking at climate-related financial risk. President Biden issued an executive order, uh, and you'll see some of the results uh, very soon, uh, that will begin to look at our climate exposure as a government, uh, including in our fiscal uh, standing, in our government programs, in our government lending, uh, and of course, also to look at the financial sector uh, and the impacts of climate and the risks of climate uh, for the financial sector. Um, second, I think we're also, uh, it's worth mentioning that we're also increasing public international climate finance. Some of this money is going to go for uh, encouraging and de-risking investments in new technologies, including some of those you're going to discuss uh, here today. Uh, we have, uh, thanks to President Biden's commitment, um, intend, we intend to increase our international climate finance to about uh, over $11 billion per year uh, by 2024. And some of that will include concessional capital uh, for fostering new technologies. We're also encouraging the multilateral development banks to uh, leverage more of their capital uh, to help uh, mobilize both existing technologies for decarbonization, as well as new technologies that are yet to reach commercial maturity. And, um, and finally, we're, we're continuing to um, uh, mobilize the incredible potential of our national labs, especially those associated with the Department of Energy, uh, which, uh, as you know, are busy researching and promoting some of the key technologies of the future. Uh, it's also worth mentioning, uh, in closing here on the public side, that we are uh, launching a first movers coalition uh, alongside the World Economic Forum. Uh, this will be a platform that allows uh, large businesses to leverage uh, their purchasing power and to signal that the markets will be there for uh, emerging technologies in eight different sectors. Those include steel, cement, aluminum, shipping, aviation, trucking, chemicals, and direct air capture. The goal here is to show that even though those technologies aren't here yet uh, at fully commercial uh, viability, that uh, the markets will be there when they are invented. And this should give comfort that uh, those investments will actually pay off. Uh, I think it's worth mentioning here that action doesn't only have to be driven by fear of what happens if we don't act. Uh, it also should be driven by the opportunity that this transition represents, which uh, as uh, some of the previous speakers have mentioned, is really the largest uh, economic opportunity since the industrial revolution. Now, let me close by asking a question here, which is what should the insurance industry look like uh, to ideally advance this uh, transition? If we were to imagine um, a transformed insurance industry, uh, what, would, what would those characteristics be? And I would posit there's six uh, points here, six uh, characteristics. One is an insurance industry that has actuarial models that are quick to adapt to emerging technologies. This is going to be crucial as the technological uh, uh, curves uh, begin to shift. We also need an insurance industry that is prepared to take the risk uh, and offer attractive rates to innovative renewable energy technologies. This will be essential to uh, boost that critical market. The third is that uh, we need an insurance industry that is creative and flexible in addressing the particular risks uh, of the renewable energy companies, not just the generic risks that apply to all sectors, but also to those that are critical uh, in, in that renewable energy space. Uh, fourth, we need an insurance industry that looks also beyond the renewable energy sector uh, and is able to promote decarbonization in sectors like electric vehicles. Uh, fifth, of course, you're also enormous uh, asset owners uh, with uh, uh, $36 trillion in uh, assets under management. Uh, it's essential that the industry also think about how to use its role 
uh, as an asset owner uh, in promoting green products. Uh, for example, uh, could the insurance industry uh, align its real estate holdings, for example, uh, to lead standards in a way that begins to then generate uh, uh, a strong market signal that these financial instruments really are worth having. And finally, of course, uh, 33 major insurance companies, including uh, led by many in the Geneva Association, have decided to exit the coal uh, insurance um, market. And uh, now I think it's gonna be crucial for others to consider doing the same. The science makes it clear that this is a bad investment long-term. Uh, and so there are many insurers still missing in action and we need them to also uh, make the same uh, type of decision. Uh, and finally, I think it's going to be crucial for investors to consider, for insurers to consider um, what it would mean to stop underwriting the expansion of oil and gas. We don't uh, long term need uh, more investments in fossil fuels. In fact, we're going to need the, those to be in the renewable sector. Uh, and this is, I think, a crucial consideration that insurers need to start making uh, at this stage. Finally, uh, let me point out that your voice in society as risk managers is enormous. Uh, your ability to promote and to raise awareness uh, of climate related risks is essential uh, and uh, everything you can do not just through pricing uh, but also through messaging uh, that this is a risk that we need to take seriously even as we cut emissions uh, is going to be essential uh, thank you very much for the opportunity i very much um, want to call on all of us to do everything we can not just to make the cop 26 a success but to make the decade of the 2020s uh, the critical decade of action. Thank you, John. Great, thank you, Leo. That's uh, that. That's some real challenges for us in the insurance industry to think about. But uh, so, so Carlotta and Leo, please stay on the panel. But let me introduce two other panelists. Uh, uh, first of all, let me introduce to you all Anthony Hobley. Anthony is currently the executive director of Mission Possible at the World Economic Forum. He's also for, former CEO at Carbon Tracker. Um, I, I really like uh, Andrew's background because he's like me, a scientist. He was originally a chemist and physicist, but unlike me, he's now uh, he's been a lawyer. So I think that's a fascinating combination of uh, skills and experience, Anthony. And what I'd really like to hear from you, and, and maybe you can help us on the panel and the audience understand. Well, we've heard the demands for revolution. We've heard some interesting uh, insights from Leo about what the insurance industry should do. But in the real economy, what, what are the kind of latest trends in demand for innovation and technological disruptions uh, in different sectors that will lead us to uh, achieving the Paris Agreement goals? Could you help us think uh, through that, please? No, absolutely. And, and it's wonderful to, to be here wearing different hats. So yes, I'm, I'm the co-executive director of the Mission Possible Partnership, which is a partnership between the World Economic Forum and the Energy Transitions Commission the Women Business Coalition and the Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, and, and it was also wonderful to hear Leonardo's plug for FMC because, you know, in, in my sort of, my, that's my day job. My evening job for the last month or two has been working with the First Movers Coalition team and many of Leonardo's colleagues and colleagues at the forum to build the FMC. And I'll talk a little bit about how these things fit together. I actually want to get granular because I, I, I see a huge opportunity um, for the insurance industry to to oil the wheels of the of the low carbon transition you know and it's going to be critically important because we we have got to transition many of our sectors particularly these these most difficult sectors the the so-called harder to abate sectors over the next 30 years and we've got quite a good idea of what that pathway looks like. So in, on the supply side, a lot of the work we've been doing on the Mission Possible Partnership is to develop these high ambition industry-backed roadmaps across the seven harder to abate sectors. So aluminium, cement, heavy chemicals, steel, trucking, shipping, aviation. Um, and those give us a good idea of what we've got to do. They also critically allow us to, to bring that sort of, you know, long away sounding commitment of 2050, right the way into the sort of current decade and to tell us where we need to be by 2025 and where we need to be by 2030. So for example, just to throw out a few examples, we know that in the steel sector, if we're gonna be on track for net zero by 2050, we have to be producing somewhere around 
230, 240 million tons of green steel by 2030. We know in the shipping sector that 5% of all shipping fuels will have to be zero emissions fuels by 2030 if we're on track. We know in the aviation sector that 10% of all aviation fuel will have to be sustainable aviation fuel by 2030. And we'll have to have made great strides to at least, you know, have the beginnings of commercial flights using other propulsion systems like electric, hydrogen, et cetera. Um, so that, that allows us also then to work out, if we go back to the steel example, you know, we can work out from that, how, you know, the, the technologies we will need to produce near zero emission steel, green steel by 2030. We can work out from that how many steel plants we have to build. Um, we've only just built one that's developed so far in the few, last few months, delivered a few kilos of steel. We can work out how much financing we will need for that, you know, number of steel plants. We can start to think about where are the best countries, the right policy uh, environments. But anyone who's who's been involved in investment, and I, in my legal career, um, I spent a bit of time on uh, investment committees. I've advised investment committees. I know quite often when you're dealing with new technologies, new approaches, investment committees who are deploying large amounts of capital get very nervous. And, and actually a lot of what they're concerned about, if they haven't got years of statistics and data around technologies um, and other approaches, um, there's a lot of perceived risk. And I think here there's a huge opportunity for the insurance industry to develop forward looking products. Let's face it, you know, the system is changing, both the, the physical system of our climate, but also our economic system has to change to get us to net zero. Um, and so you can no longer use a, a lot of our backward looking methods to assess risk. And in many ways, the insurance industry has been a pioneer as is the finance industry in starting to think about how do we develop forward looking scenarios and pathways to assess risk. We've got to use those now to develop products that address those perceived risks, help to oil the wheels um, and accelerate the implementation of these technologies and the capital that's gonna be critical for them. And I think that that is a that is a major role for the insurance sector and a major opportunity in developing these new products. So let's think about what that might look like in practice and, and where the insurance in, industry, the, I'm sure the people on, on this panel and the audience are greater experts than me. So I'll lay out what has to happen. What, you know, and maybe we can have a discussion about, you know, the sort of products, the sort of opportunities can be developed. So we know from our demand side work with Mission Possible, where we've got to be by 2030 um, in, the, in those sectors I outlined. With FMC, we're trying to build a forward demand curve um, from companies to get enough demand for that 240 million tons of green steel or enough ships and or tons of freight that, that would go on those, those zero emissions vessels that use that 5% of fuel and aviation and so on. We are then gonna work with the various finance initiatives, the Transition Finance Initiative at the Forum, the Center for Climate Aligned Finance at RMI, GFANS and others to mobilize the capital. We will then work with governments um, to develop the enabling policy environments and the sort of blended finance that we heard about earlier to sort of de-risk that. But I think there's another pillar here that, that you know, a lot of people don't think about when they think about that systems change and orchestrating that systems change, which is this industry, the insurance industry. And I think it's very obvious if you've had any exposure to the insurance industry that the insurance industry can play a huge role in developing the products to address the risks of such an accelerated transition over the next 30 years and the decommissioning of high carbon assets and the accelerated rollout and development of these low carbon technologies and assets. So I think that's one important role. I think the other important role, um, and I think this was touched on by Spinoza, that we've got to get real. I mean, we've got to go from, you know, the commitments and Paris was great at developing the ambition and has been great at, at, at sort of, you know, one, one of the most successful children of Paris is the, the whole net zero approach and the net zero, the drive to take on net zero commitments. But Glasgow has to be the cop of um, action um, and implementation, converting those net zero commitments into tangible action and strategies for implementing net zero. And I think that's the other role the insurance industry can play is developing the tools and the methodologies to assess how robust those transition strategies are company by company, financial institution by financial institution and rating those companies accordingly um, because they've got to have a good transition strategy. I think if they're going to be addressing the risks that we're going to be facing from a destabilized climate, 
but also the risks that companies face, I think, as we transition to net zero and not being left behind. Great. Th thanks, Anthony. No, that's really uh, some really excellent points there. So, so I, I just want to remind the audience that uh, while you're listening to us talk about this and answering my, some of my questions, it, uh, please think up your questions. I'm sure they're burning in your mind already as you heard everyone speak. Uh, and uh, you can do that in two ways. You can either put a question into the Q&A, that's probably the best way of doing it, or if you're prepared to speak yourself, uh, just press the raise the hand button uh, and then I'll call you in uh, to, to be part of the conversation. But before we get into that, let me also introduce uh, John Colas. Uh, John is Vice President for Oliver Wyman Financial Services in America. Uh, John is also the co-author of a report called Managing the Risk in the U.S. Financial System. So, so John, you, you seem to be perfectly placed to answer some questions here about how uh, these traditional financing ecosystems that we have that uh, you know, some of the previous uh, panelists have referred to, how, how are they appropriate if, and if they're not? What needs to change in the complex financial system to direct the flow of capital at scale and at pace uh, to make these technological changes happen? Great. Uh, thank you, John, very much for that um, question. And I would also just like to thank the Geneva, Geneva Association, Charles and Mary Ann, and the entire team for their leadership in organizing today's conference and driving forward uh, this important insight sharing and discussion. Uh, with respect to your question, John, I think just simply the question with respect to is the current financial system able to move at pace and at scale to address the challenges that each of you have outlined in your remarks? And my response to that is simply not yet, not currently. And that um, is... Uh, due to a number of, of uh, important reasons. But just for a little bit of context, there is definitely a significant amount of capital flowing into climate solutions. Uh, the climate tech agenda that uh, uh, Maryam outlined at the beginning, there are definitely opportunities that uh, financing is working to address uh, with regards to industrial decarbonization. But the financing system as it exists today will not deliver. Um, and we really view this as uh, an issue of market fa failure. Um, and this will not be resolved uh, by the actions of individual stakeholders alone. So picking up uh, in large measure on uh, Professor Carlotta's uh, remarks as well. Here, um, there is a desperate need for a mechanism uh, that really engages the universe of stakeholders to co-design and coordinate climate action. And uh, over the last uh, 15 months, I've had the privilege of working together with a group of committed uh, financiers, industrialists, philanthropists, uh, and um, devotees to driving climate action uh, with the World Economic Forum in their initiative called Financing the Transition to Net Zero FTT. And Anthony Hobley and the Mission Possible Partnership have also been very much part of that work. And drawing on this work, our primary recommendation and finding is that we need to redesign um, the engagement that currently exists across the financial sector in order to accelerate the pace uh, of decarbonization at scale across the globe. And there, uh, one of the challenges is simply, as we look out to the commitments to 2030, and then we look out at the commitments from 2030 to 2050, what we realize is that uh, many of the technologies that will be needed in the 2030 to 2050 period are really at a very early stage today and they will require validation and deployment at commercial scale. Um, and in order to do that, there needs to be a pooling of capital to help scale and deploy these new technologies. And this will require um, not only the private sector playing its part, but it will need to be complemented by public sector intervention. And this will include engagement 
with multilateral development banks as anchor investors, and of course, with the insurance industry helping to play its role in designing innovative products, as well as uh, mobilizing capital in terms of uh, early stage uh, investing, as well as longer term patient capital to support uh, the development and deployment of these technologies. So one of the prerequisites as we see it right now is to really think about this new multi-stakeholder uh, transition finance ecosystem, bringing all of the parties together. Uh, as we think about this, one of the challenges is that in our traditional financing system, there is an experience of technology firms, which is often what we refer to as uh, the valley of death. And that is the period where the technology itself exists, but there isn't yet enough uh, demand and capital for the companies to punch through to the other side. And so bringing forward the demand for those technologies in concert with the financing structures is something that we see as critical. The demand and deployment of those technologies can be expedited and facilitated by the role of governments in terms of their capturing of demand, their creation of uh, demand that will uh, seed uh, the scaling of the technology. It will also be influenced by market mechanisms in terms of uh, guarantees that may exist through export credit agencies or that may exist through um, multilateral banks as well. And importantly, in order for these technologies to really gain traction, we have to recognize that if we don't place these bets now, our ability to go beyond the halving of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 uh, will be significantly uh, imperiled. And so again, just coming back to your question, John, we see the need for the development of a uh, multi-stakeholder transition finance ecosystem. It's different from the finance ecosystem that exists today. It does require pulling forward both supply and demand of capital and it does require additional and different types of risk taking uh, across the ecosystem. That's great, John, thank you. Yes, that sounds like we're going back to Carlotta's uh, revolution. It sounds like that's not an evolution. It sounds like quite a dramatic change. So I think that's a huge challenge for us. And uh, we've had uh, a couple of uh, questions from the audience. Uh, this most recent one I thought was interesting for all the panelists really to have a go at answering. And, it, it's it's not a cynical question, but it's just calling out that, that market mechanisms uh, are potentially insufficient to address climate change and the technology changes that are required to address it. So what is the role for governments and in particular international policy coordination and how to facilitate given that there are going to be winners and losers? So uh, perhaps I could start off with Leo on that one if Leo is still on the call. John, Leo uh, could not attend uh, panel one. Ah, was only, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Okay, that's no problem. So uh, it would have been great to hear it from a government uh, official. But uh, Anthony, let me uh, turn to you. I mean, you spend a lot of time uh, on First Movers Coalition and so on. So, so uh, what, what's your views on this? Are the market mechanisms going to work or, or does it need more sort of government intervention, change in subsidies and so on? Well, we, we need we need both. I, I mean, and I guess I, I speak from an organization, the World Economic Forum, that considers itself the, the IO for public private collaboration. So, you know, a lot of our work involves that partnership between the private sector and the public sector. And that's going to be absolutely critical here. But I, you know, I, I think what we have to avoid is, is the private sector saying, well, you know, it, the public sector has to act and the public sector saying the private sector act has, to ha has to act. Actually, both have to act. And the best way for them to act is to work together um, in collaboration to identify and, and co-design the right enabling policy environments. And that's at the heart of the theory of change to the Mission Possible Partnership. So a lot of our work with the most ambitious companies across these sectors is to, to understand the, the sequencing of technologies, 
understand the policies that are needed to facilitate those technologies. To some degree, you know, companies stepping up to prove that these technologies can work with quite sharing the cost and risk amongst themselves, sometimes sharing the cost and risk with the public sector. But I think that's critically important because if politicians can see that we can get there, um, they're more likely to provide the support in policy environment. And I, I think I would also say, I, I think we're moving beyond that sort of neoliberal view that the markets can do everything. So I think it is a good question um, from, from the, uh, the audience member that's asked it. And the reality is, all technological, uh, I mean, Carlotta did a great job of sort of giving us a historical perspective on these different phases of development. Governments were involved in all of those to, to one degree or another. It's probably not well known, um, but the, the, the global oil industry we now have is as a result of strategic government intervention in the beginning of the 20th century. You know, it was not a given that the, all the automobiles that we now drive would be powered by liquid fuel. You know, the, the three competing technologies, as we know, at the outset of the, the automobile era were electric automobiles, you know, um, gas powered automobiles and liquid fuel automobiles. It was a decision, I believe, and I'm sure someone will correct me on the history, but as I understand it, by Winston Churchill, when he was first Lord of the Admiralty, who wanted a global supply chain for oil for, for geopolitical reasons to convert British warships from steam to oil. And it was the British government who made a big push and followed by others. Um, and with a lot of government support to develop the global oil markets and supply chains. Um, you know, the, the iPhone, we have a lot of the technology here as a result of US government um, investment and in R&D. So governments are always involved and we need to recognize that. And we need to develop an approach that involves you know, business on the supply side, with Mission Possible is doing a lot of that work, business on the demand side, so the First Movers Coalition, the financial industry, and John did a great uh, overview of, of the work there that's going on, and, and his organisation's playing a huge role in supporting our work, in supporting GFANS and many of the other initiatives, um, and then governments, so we need to work with the most ambitious governments to design the enabling policy environments to help scale those technologies. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Anthony. Uh, Carlotta, I see you have your hand up. Uh, you, you, uh, can we have a comment from you, please? Part of what I was going to say was said by Anthony. But basically, I think the most important thing now is for business to start to stop thinking that government is the problem. Government now is the solution. You've got to work with government and changing the attitude of business Oh no, I'm sorry, I thought I had unmuted myself. So I begin again, that what I was going to say was basically what Anthony said, that it's time for collaboration. Basically that business must stop thinking that government is the problem. Government now is the solution. In fact, changing government now is the solution. What we cannot have is either the old bureaucratic governments that, that resulted at the end of the mass production golden age in the 50s and 60s, nor the minimal austerity bound, hands bound government that has been acting during all this time when markets have been doing all the changes. We now need to work together and we need to stop thinking that government cannot do it. If government does not modernize itself, it cannot do it. So we need new institutions, we need new sorts of policies, we need to think seriously about which would be the conditions that would do the one most important thing, to make it more profitable to invest in the right things, which are both smart, green, and also fair and global, because globalization also needs a revamping, a renewal. So we have four areas where we have to make it more profitable to do the right thing in those four areas than to do the old obsolete things. Right now, that's the reason why we can call it a revolution because it is actually tilting the whole playing field, changing the conditions of relation, incorporating business into consensus institutions and incorporating social actors into new consensus building institutions so that we can get where we want to get in the short time we have. 
We've got to do it together. That's Thank basically you. my message. Uh, uh, and as a revolution in all the sectors, as you pointed out, th that's exactly right. Thank you, Carlotta. So we've got time for just to answer one more question. I'm going to direct this. It's come from the audience, but I'm going to direct this at John. Uh, it's come from Florent Fleury. Uh, and the question is, do you think that the prudential and regulatory capital guidelines, uh, which have uh, capital and liquidity implications, could help the insurance companies to shift their portfolios? So it's really a question about how do you manage the uh, investments that are required that uh, Patricia Espinosa talked about and others, uh, but sort of matching that against the other fiduciary duties of uh, an insurance company in their asset portfolio? So, John, maybe you could give a yeah. answer to that. Right. Happy to, John, and uh, thank you for the question. What I would um, say is that when you look at the movement that's taking place in the regulatory community globally with the introduction by the UK's PRA for the biennial exploratory scenarios or the ECB in terms of climate stress tests. When you look at that from an insurance perspective, uh, particularly with regards to um, the PRA and the work that they've been driving, what I would say is that there is certainly the opportunity uh, for that to influence the shape of the insurance industry in terms of its decisions and behaviors. What you have to think about when you look at the regulatory directors is that they are principally focused on um, the systemic risk, the stability of the banking system. And what they would like to see is that the individual institutions, be they insurers or be they banks, have a robust understanding of climate risks and do not pose you know, threat to the entire system. So the pressure emerging from the regulatory side is really to encourage the industries to develop that deeper understanding of climate risk. And with that deeper understanding of climate risk comes a deeper understanding of the opportunities that climate presents. And so that ought to flow through directly to strategic planning and capital allocation decisions which will ultimately lead to the cleaning and greening uh, of the economy uh, in order to capture the opportunities specifically that uh, Anthony and Carlotta and others have cited uh, today. So I do see the regulatory directives as moving toward uh, that reallocation of capital, but it's not to put a thumb on the scale, it's really to drive that deep understanding of the risks and therefore the opportunities. Fantastic. Thank you for that answer. So we come to the end of the panel, really. Um, thank you to all the panelists and, and thank you for the audience for your questions as well. Uh, just to finish off, I'd like to go back to Carlotta, Anthony and, and John and just ask them uh, really to give us a, not, not a one minute, but really a one sentence summary uh, of your uh, views on, on this topic. So Carlotta, maybe uh, uh, can I go to you first? Well, basically, we are at a moment that's similar to the end of the Second World War. We have a whole set of problems and an enormous potential to use to get to a prosperous society for all. And uh, we've got to do it. That's basically my point. I like that. We've got to do it. Excellent. Uh, spoken like a true revolutionary. Uh, Anthony, uh, <laughs> a sentence of you, please. If you can get the most ambitious 20% of, of, of any community, uh, they, they can change everyone. It's like dominoes and baseball. You know, ident let's identify, you know, the most ambitious dominoes at the beginning, get them falling, um, you know, the, the supply side, the buy side, financial institutions and governments, um, and that will get us to first base, second base, third base and fourth base. So base baseball and dominoes is, is my one sentence. Fantastic. A good analogy to, for us all to remember. And finally, John, let me finish with you. Yeah, thank you, John. So simply, I would say to mobilize the trillions needed for the net zero transition, we need to cultivate a multi-stakeholder transition finance ecosystem and mechanisms allowing collective action are ultimately the need of the hour. Perfect. Collective action, revolution, and baseball and dominoes. What, what a better way to describe this uh, or answer this very tough set of questions on 
technology and the technology transition. So thank you very much to my panelists. Uh, and uh, uh, Mariam, I'm just going to hand back to you for uh, to tell us what's going to happen next. Thank you so much, and thank you for a very rich discussion. Thank you, Carlotta, John, John, and Anthony. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, we will now go into a short coffee break for about four minutes, and we will come back to the second panel where we will discuss how can insurers future-proof and finance technological pathways to scale decarbonization. So see you in about four minutes. Thank you. Hello again. Welcome back to the second panel of this event, which brings CEOs and executives from the industry, engineering, finance, and insurance to discuss how can insurers future-proof and finance technological pathways to scale decarbonization. Before we start, uh, I would like to uh, play a video message from uh, Nagano-san, chairman of Tokyo Marine Holdings and co-chair of Geneva Association Climate Change and Environment Working Group to set the stage. Hello, everyone. My name is Nick Nagano and I am privileged to co-chair the Geneva Association's Working Group on Climate Change and Emerging Environmental Risks with Dennis Kessler, Chairman of SCOL. The Working Group conducts strategic research and supports the development of new technologies and other initiatives that may help the insurance industry contribute to the innovation of society to reach net zero by 2050. According to the International Energy Agency, achieving net zero by 2050 implies that almost half the emissions reductions needs to come from new technologies that are currently at the demonstration or prototype phase. Commercialization of unproven technologies translates to increased level of risk. The insurance industry, with its expertise in risk assessment and management, can play an important role as specialists in assessing and managing risk. We want to be catalyst for other stakeholders and consumers in better managing risks of new, unestablished technologies including hydrogen, large-scale battery systems, and carbon capture, utilization, and storage. This innovation needs to be extended to many other sectors as well. We can work proactively with governments and corporates to make good use of insurance and related to products to help manage untested risks and attract quality investments to those advantaged technologies and to support them on their unique pathways to net zero. I will leave further details of the working group to Mariam's, but may I take this opportunity to thank the OECD for their cooperation, as well as everyone involved in hosting the meeting. Finally, may I wish everyone participating today a truly beneficial meeting. Thank you. Back to Mariam. Thank you very much, Nagano-san. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the panelists in this session. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Peter Bakker, President and CEO of World Business Council on Sustainable Development. Denise Bauer, Member of Executive Board of Mott McDonald. Mark Verse, CEO of Aviva Investors. And Joachim Wenning, CEO and Chairman of Board of Management at Munich Re Group. Now today's panel the objectives of our discussions are to look at the role of insurers and reinsurers 
in de-risking and financing technological pathways from early stage to commercialization and large-scale deployment. What innovations from insurance sector is, are needed to be able to play the role for de-risking and financing technological pathways. I think there were a lot of discussions and a lot of comments to that uh, from uh, the earlier speakers. And then finally, how can we forge the type of partnerships that are needed uh, to enable and incentivize innovation, sectoral adoption, and implementation of technology at scale? So we will start the session with short statements from our panelists. I would like to first uh, invite Peter. Peter, you've served as the CEO of TNT, a global transport logistic company, and now as the president and CEO of uh, World Business Council on Sustainable Development. Um, now, you've been working and you continue to work to CEOs of many corporations. Can you elaborate on what trends are you seeing among corporations from different sectors on their investment in technological disruptions and what would it take for companies to actually create the demand and adopt these technologies for their transitioning? Well, thank you, Miriam. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, good afternoon, good day, everybody. Uh, nice to see you online. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very good time to talk about the link between techno technological innovation and, uh, and a net zero e economy. Um, you know, what I see happen at the moment in business is uh, the, the big global challenges are converging. It's the, the climate emergency, the loss of nature, growing inequality. They are now all on the desk of, of uh, CEOs and boards of companies. And we therefore need to have a very clear long-term vision. You know, we, we in WBCSD have created one in which we said there are nine plus billion people living well within planetary boundaries by mid-century. And even though that, that's a relatively simply worded vision, if you think a bit about it, it requires a wholesale transformation of everything we know. Energy needs to decarbonize, materials need to go circular, food needs to be produced sustainably, equitably, and provide healthy diets to all the people on the planet. And even though that's an ambitious vision, it is within reach. You know, the, the good news is that business has already contributed to important progress. You know, the innovations and technologies have begun to pave the way to transition to a low carbon economy. Companies around the world are now setting science-based net zero carbon targets in line with the Paris Agreement and in many ways walk ahead of governments at this point in time. Uh, beyond the emission reduction, we now see significant investments moving into nature-based solutions that mitigate climate change while protecting biodiversity and life fields. Important new circular business models are emerging that drastically cut waste and trillions of dollars of assets are now being managed with considerations to ESG, ESG, the environmental, social and governance data. But we also know we need to do much more. You know, the energy system specifically really needs to move to provide sustainable energy to all people. You know, net zero carbon energy is gonna be the future. And for this, technological disruption and innovation will be crucial. And uh, not just in the move to a net zero world, but in the actual planning of decarbonization for companies and their value chains. So for that, companies are now focusing on building the internal capacity, become literate in digital technologies, transform their businesses, real transformational agendas are emerging. They need to be familiar with climate science, with clean technologies, with trajectories and cost curves, to avoid either being on the bleeding edge or on falling behind. And so if you look at this then, particular uh, new innovations in hydrogen with a 10 year horizon are, are things that we see emerge, pretty similar to where solar and wind may have gone through in the last two decades. What can we do with the cost curve of hydrogen in the next 10 years? So a big agenda, uh, absolutely important that technology and innovation is at the center. It's really 
in our opinion, the, uh, the absolute driver for initiating the system transformation that we that the world now needs. And I think, again, setting clear targets, implementing operating plans, aiming the research and development uh, dollars towards those new technological breakthroughs is going to be really what will drive us. Um, uh, and so I'll leave it at that as an introduction. Back to you, Mariam. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. Denise, let's uh, come to you. As an executive of a large international engineering company, you work with governments and corporations to implement large scale projects and infrastructure systems that utilize these new technologies. What do you see by way of nature of these risks and what are the challenges with scaling up these projects that are utilizing new technologies, starting from energy and moving to other sectors that you're working with? Oh, thank you, Mariam, and thank you to the Geneva Association and the OECD for inviting me to join everybody today. Really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, as a global engineering management and development business, we see firsthand the unprecedented level of transformation required to support a just energy transition. So I would like to echo some of the themes that have already been raised in the conference. We believe that we must continue to explore models for multi-sector strategic partnerships that will engage the public and private sectors in a virtuous circle of reducing climate risk and enhancing resilience. We've got to reconfigure our infrastructure systems to deliver substantially different outcomes from those that they were designed for. And we've got less than 30 years to prepare and deliver this. If you just think about the life cycle of an infrastructure project, you know, that's not very long at all, is it? This provides multiple strategic challenges to the private sector and especially to governments too. The consequences are that in mature economies, governments will need to place multiple and potentially costly bets on different technological approaches, knowing that not all will succeed. And the private sector needs to embrace a way of working that's subject to policy pivots as governments become adept at a fail fast approach to decision making. We all know people prefer a highly stable environment. So the institutional change we were hearing about earlier, I think is gonna be absolutely crucial to um, unlocking the potential that we could um, we could derive. The barriers to innovation are unique to the technology. We've heard that already. And scaling up requires a degree of market certainty, as I was just saying. Now, governments can be key here to bridging that valley of death. We've already heard that term earlier in the conference too, between lab prototypes and early commercial deployment. And we are involved in these programmes, bringing our understanding of what deployment at scale will need to look like. In the allocation of risk, we need to consider how the public sector can encourage investment in resilience and clean technology. The UK's approach to offshore wind, creating an environment that unlocked implementation is a really good example. There are, however, lessons to be learned in mutual reinforcement, funding to increase UK competitiveness and cost reduction, and providing long-term certainty to underpin investment. The result of the approach that was adopted was a three-fold cost reduction as the industry scaled over a 10 year period. But it's important to note this was based on a clear policy bet taken at the outset by UK government on behalf of society. Many of the policy choices now before us is not a clear, are not as clear cut. And many of the technologies involved are rather less mature than offshore wind was at the start of that process that I just mentioned. Insurance will have a key role to play in making these new technologies bankable. And it may be that partnerships between government and insurers are needed as part of the overall maturity pathway. So I've been pleased to hear about the, uh, the move for collaboration and engendering collaboration until sufficient construction and operating experience has been gained. So I'm happy to explore this further, Mariam, as our discussion continues or dig into areas like partnerships or a little bit more on the sort of fragmentation associated with innovation. Thanks very much. And thank you so much, and obviously a lot to follow up in the Q&A. And I also like to invite our audience to start submitting your questions in writing or raise your hands. Now, with that, I'd like to move to Mark Verse. Uh, Mark, as a regulated global institutional investor with your risk return profile, what are the challenges and opportunities in investing in new technology pathways for decarbonizations. Uh, John Colas talk about the need for total reform 
of the financial sector and you know looking at different investors for different risk and um, uh, return profiles. So Mark, where do insurers fit in in this whole process of innovation to commercialization to deployment at scale? If you can make some comments on that. Uh, certainly. Uh, thank you, Mariam, and thank you for inviting me to talk um, uh, on this very important topic. Uh, so look, insurers right now, um, it's predominantly about financing the transition. So it's, it's less about direct investment into technology pathways. It's more indirect to financing the corporates who, who are building the technology to deliver their own transition. And a great example of that would be car manufacturers uh, investing in battery and hydrogen research. And we heard earlier about the seven industry sectors and the changes that are needed there. So, so it's exactly supporting those um, in industries uh, to get there. Our role is to work out the winners and the losers uh, within that technology race. And that's sort of the main way we make a difference to the economy and society. Um, but, but we will invest direct. And uh, the example we just heard about offshore wind is a great example. Uh, we're not the leaders in the tech advancements. Uh, we get involved once uh, the cash flows become much more predictable because uh, we use them to match our liabilities. Uh, so, so we're looking to, to have construction risk, political risk, technology risk uh, reduced, uh, which can enable us to, to more accurately predict the cash flows we'll get. So that's when we get involved uh, on a much, much larger scale, much, much more directly. Uh, today, that's electrification of transport. It's buying buildings, uh, making them green. Uh, it's in the renewable energy, offshore wind, as I said, a, a great, um, uh, we've done huge amounts of financing in that space. Um, we are starting to see some opportunities in large scale energy storage, uh, but it's pretty early. Nature based solutions we heard about earlier, really nascent right now, but, but credible offset solutions are going to be absolutely needed for insurers to hit their own targets on their asset portfolios. And then eventually tech like carbon capture storage, hygiene related solutions, they will come along and we will invest direct. Right now, the focus is on the corporates. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And I, I wanna come back um, in our Q&A, particularly around the area of large scale deployment at the Geneva Association, we've been working particularly in the area of sustainable infrastructure. And, and you know, we are all also seeing a lot of finance being deployed through VCs and pension funds into that arena and we will come back to you know asking you sort of what's what are requirements from sort of your risk uh return profile and insurers a life insurer's risk return profile excellent so let's move to Joachim Wenning um you Joachim my goodness we have a tall order from this conference uh for the insurance industry particularly when it comes to the risking, uh, the untested risk of new technologies uh, that are going to be crucial to enable economic sectors to transition. And of course, many of these risks don't come with historical data. This is something that we need to look forward. We also heard uh, about um, how we need to innovate our industry and how would our industry look uh, ahead in the future. So. What are your thoughts uh, responding to what we've heard today in terms of role of insurance industry uh, to play its role in de-risking the technological pathways? Where should insurance get in and how far they should go? Over to you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mariam, and thank you very much for the invitation today. It's a pleasure being with you. Um, what's the role of the insurance and uh, how are we stepping in? My first statement would be, maybe surprisingly, we have already stepped in. Uh, so let me be a little bit more concrete and give you some example, at least from our company. So let's remember that Munich Re has been addressing technology risks, not necessarily climate related technology risks for almost 150 years. It's a fact and many other insurers have been doing so as well. And we have been about, 10 years ago, uh, the first insurer globally to cover performance risks of solar, wind, and, uh, and batteries. And today, uh, 
uh, it's good to remember uh, we are um, also working on solutions addressing the next wave uh, of uh, technology risk, like e-mobility, uh, like carbon removal technologies, uh, but also uh, larger scale hydrogen infrastructure uh, related risks. So we have built up a deep expertise in new renewable energy, energy technologies, and we continue to do so going forward. Yet, and this brings me to my second statement, uh, I do see a challenge in the fact that pretty often the problem is not the technology itself. Maybe it's not existent at scale already, but there is a technological solution. There is a technological prototype, uh, but the problem is rather of commercial nature in the sense of what do you do if you have a prototype, but there is no market yet. And uh, if as insurers or reinsurers now you say, well, I can do the risk assessment. I can even offer solutions, but this is not the limiting factor because there is no market. There is no demand yet. Which brings me to the third statement is, uh, I think we urgently need as quickly as possible, a sufficiently high, uh, really relevant carbon price uh, as the preferred, I would say, technology neutral uh, policy instrument. We need to bring that, and I believe this will contribute uh, to uh, creating and driving new markets to emerge. And I'm referring to the first panel before, I think countries, governments and industries across, we need sort of what I call a master plan. We need sort of a master plan making clear how much carbon removal do we actually need? How much is it? What's the volume? And where will it come from? And who is going to produce it? Where are we going to install it? And how will we make the market make this happen? Or uh, renewable energies. Uh, I mean, how much more renewable energy do we need at global scale? Eight times more than we have currently. But how much is that per country? And will it be wind, water? Will it be solar? Let's be concrete and take stock of that uh, in a government across industry, uh, I would say project. This is what I would do as a company. I would run a project and have a steering committee going after this and make clear where is the renewable energy coming from? Who will produce it? Who's gonna insure it? And how do we make the markets uh, drive this? Uh, so I will stop here as an introduction, Mark. Excellent. Thank you so much for this. Uh, so let's bring what we've heard from earlier on and what we've heard from you together and, and go back to this whole issue of creation of market demand. And obviously, as Carlota and others have said, you know, we need to work with governments who play a critical role in creation of that market demand. But let's go back to the clusters that are developing within the market, for example, through the work that you're doing, Peter, with World Business Council on Sustainable Development or what Anthony Hobley and, and his team are doing with Mission Possible. These are all aiming to bring the ultimate users of technology, the corporations together to create that market demand through market forces to the extent that for now those clear policies are missing. So Peter, let me come back to you and, and ask you, what can we do by way of scaling these clusters? Uh, you know, we do have these clusters, but they are working in silos still. How can we scale these clusters? You know, Gates uh, Fund is creating a range of clusters. Uh, you know, you have a work. Is there a way that we can create these clusters and that market demand through working directly with the corporations? And if so, where do you think insurers could play a role to incentivize that? I think it will be really critical to bring together um, 
value chains. <clears throat> more and more, we are stepping away from the belief that individual companies, as important that, as it is that they set net zero targets, create operating plans to decarbonize, but the real scale will be delivered once we bring a value chain together, all the way from raw material down to the end consumption and even the waste collection and management uh, beyond that consumption. And once you do that, you know, you begin to see the scale of the, uh, the task ahead. You know, the IEA saying there's 4 trillion of annual investments needed in the energy system. If you make it pragmatic, the, uh, the automotive companies over the last uh, few, well, even the last year or so, have now committed more than 330 billion in investments to move to an electrified battery technology-based decarbonization. At individual company level, you know, we're beginning to focus more and more at the hard to abate sectors, the chemical companies and the likes. One example, uh, BASF, uh, one individual company, 4 billion investment until 2030. The food system has a lot of attention these days. We'll need 350 billion each year just to deal with its climate related transition. So the numbers are staggering. We really need to uh, to work together to mobilize a the, the value chains to bring the scale and the demand, as you say, but also to then have a joint offer or ask to both the policymakers. And I, I totally agree with Joachim. You know, we need a hundred dollars a ton carbon price, and we need it quick. Uh, but to be honest, I've been hammering this message since 2015 in Paris. Uh, and that's a slow boat. So we need to continue to work. And, and, and that's where I believe capital market to corporations are going to be the main lever now for change. I obviously, where the insurers have to come in <clears throat> is two things. Is one is, you know, we need to put risk at the center of every conversation now. Uh, we in, in the corporate world have done a lot of work on how do you integrate environmental and social risks into the enterprise risk management systems. But I'm sure there's a lot we can learn from actually the insurance industry, because it's your business to, to be able to um, appreciate and, and value risks. But the other area, and <clears throat> maybe that's another part of your, of your conference this afternoon, and then I, I will hold my point, but I was in a really big global meetings with the heads of the IMF, the African Development Bank and others, where people are saying we should not only invest in technologies that will decarbonize, we need to have a real push in adaptation because without adaptation, big parts of the society will just not be able to thrive in the future. And all our other agendas like the SDGs or inequality will be gone to waste. And what, I've, what I noted in that particular meeting is the insurance industry is completely missing in the adaptation debate. And that is where I, you know, with my layman knowledge of insurance, I admit that immediately, where I would have expected the insurers to be the first to move because adaptation is risk avoidance, you know, it's, it's, and anyway, that would be one other thought that I would put in, the, in this panel and see how my colleagues react. Thank you. Thank you so much. Joachim, maybe you want to respond to this whole point on, on what insurers have been doing uh, in the area of adaptation. And, and I think probably Peter, what you're observing goes back to my first point of the siloed world of conversations and different platforms that, you know, mm -hmm. are we talking the right uh, clusters and so on. Joachim, uh, any thoughts on you know, a, a balanced uh, set of solutions that includes adaptation and mitigation and what uh, the industry's leadership in the, in the area of adaptation. Uh, so my first statement here would be, I totally agree with Peter, uh, only focusing, only uh, focusing on new technologies uh, to combat climate change and temperature increase would not be sufficient. We need to also invest into adaptation. I agree, adaptation is risk avoidance. And in many areas of the world and the most fragile ones, this is maybe the only solution. So we need to take care of it. So I, I agree with that. Is the insurance industry involved in that or isn't it? 
Uh, I start thinking about it uh, when you raise the point, Peter, and I think it is involved. How is it involved? It is certainly involved where individuals try to naturally reduce the risk premium which they have to pay for whatever asset they want to protect by you know building some 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 risk avoiding risk mitigating measures around their assets right and they get a premium reduction that is the incentive and then we find the right balance between what's the cost of insurance and what's the cost of risk mitigation and then the insurers take a pretty meaningful and rational uh, decisions that's been happening that's part of you know ongoing risk management in our industry with regard to any risk that we are talking about even at corporate re levels that is totally uh, state of the art when it comes to um, adaptation which needs funding on a on a on a national or multinational level uh, then typically it's the states taking care of that. So either they take care of that or they don't take care of, of that. Uh, I know one or two instances where states have been asking the insurance industry to pool that and to fund that, but normally it's what the states reserve from themselves. But could the insurance industry get involved and the states call them? They could. Excellent. I want to come to just to wrap up this conversation before we move to some elements of investment and we have a hand raised in the audience. I want to come to Denise. I think you've been working heavily uh, with a very large platform on development of new infrastructure systems with a very balanced view of role of infrastructure for mitigation, but also looking at building a resilient infrastructure. Can you uh, tell us a little bit uh, how this shapes and what do you see role of insurers by way of managing risk on both fronts? Any experiences uh, that you've acquired through this new uh, collaborations? Thank you, Mary. I'm delighted to say um, a few words about the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment. And I was just checking um, while, while, while um, while we were talking there, the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment does have four insurers um, as, as part of that coalition, which is absolutely brilliant and right at the heart of the modelling that we're doing too. So, you know, earlier on, Charles mentioned the need to protect critical assets. We've just heard during this panel the need for an um, adaptation and there's learning from project level climate related risk methodologies, which is what we've been bringing into um, the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment, where we've been collaborating across the infrastructure investment industry. Um, we've, we've been working hard um, as part of that coalition to develop the physical climate risk assessment methodology. So bringing in both those aspects, just to reiterate, of risk and adaptation. Uh, we call it PCRAM for short, so I might refer to it as that now on. Um, but it's a framework that looks at efficiently pricing physical risks to encourage resilience actions that improve revenue and provide more predictable cash flows. So for example, if you've got a railway line and you want to know, you know, if the temperature, if it's in the UK is above 50 degrees, 10 days or more a year, what effect will that have on cash flow? And PCREM can help you to assess that model. So we brought together uh, the, the, the climate data with the sort of physical asset data in a highly collaborative gated process that allows investors to build maturity and improve understanding of the climate related risks as the climate science evolves and as the understanding of the asset and, and or its purpose changes. So it can be developed to look at interdependencies and we're identifying further opportunities to improve the wider system, because I'm sure all of those who are engaged in the conversation today, you know, with a good understanding of risk, understand the interconnected nature of those risks as well. So we had to get it right at individual asset level first, and now we're scaling up to um, a more systemic approach. But we do see that although it's been developed for um, management of physical risk and adaptation, it could also be applied to transition risks. Um, and we've also found the focus on asset management, which is a, a much more common language, um, is important as we are forming the new partnerships that we've been talking about. So I'll, I'll keep it quite brief at that, Marion, but there's much more Excellent. information available about the Coalition for Climate Resilient Investment. And it's good when I was just double checking that there are at least four insurance organizations as part of that coalition. 
I want to come back to this later and link it back to a question to Mark. But first, I want to ask uh, Yoshi Kawai, uh, one of our audience, has raised his hand. Yoshi, would you like to pose your question uh, to the panel? Yes, thank you, Marian. Uh, I want to ask question to Joachim and also Mark. So yeah, nice to see you again. Just one question is, uh, you are uh, reinsurance, particularly uh, underwriting pas uh, aspect. We discuss a lot of investment side, but underwriting perspective, uh, particularly reinsurance is uh, sort of an uh, insurance supply chain or high end of insurance supply chain. So insurance, reinsurance or uh, strategy of underwriting has a huge impact on the industry particularly for the transition or transition strategy. So for example, uh, Patricia Espinosa mentioned that the uh, uh, industry should not underwrite anything against Paris Agreement. And one uh, idea is not underwriting any, anything against uh, coal, coal industry. And, but how you can use this underwriting capacity to encourage uh, de-risking and you know, transforming our uh, industry uh, not only coal industry, but other industry, if you have a clear strategy against underwriting to a specific carbon emitted industry, you have a strong power to encourage uh, the risking. So do you have any sort of thought or your uh, initiative to make best use of your underwriting capacity? And Mark, very quickly, a, que a question to investment, you know, uh, time horizon, usually I understand it's one year, or time horizon, but you know, this kind of, you know, you should need a long-term investment strategy. So how do you cope with this time horizon issue when you consider this, you know, type of uh, investment? Thank you. Mario, shall I, shall I yes, start? Yes, of course, you, you should, you should, please. Excellent, thank you very much. And Yoshi, thanks for your question and good to hear you again, at least in these video conferences. Um, so how much can insurers or reinsurance uh, contribute to setting standards towards a, I don't know, towards insuring more and more and only green stuff, if you allow me to be uh, so blunt. And all of this, uh, I must repeat it, in the absence of the right economic incentives of just putting a carbon price, which would be the easiest thing and the cleanest to get things clear, uh, or if society wanted to sort of just embargo one or the other fossil energy, which I'm not suggesting like, uh, like this in a brutal way, uh, they could do that. So in the absence of all things that would make more sense in my view, what can we insurers and reinsurers do? I think, and this is our own path at Munich Re, we think uh, we have a market share uh, in the industry uh, which is not large enough that we can sort of impose our own positioning on the whole world, uh, let alone whether we wanted it if we had an 80% of the market share, but we have a 12 or 13% market share, we couldn't. I think if you want to do that, you have to be way more powerful. We are, and don't misunderstand me that this is an excuse. So what do you then do? Uh, you can set a good example and just say we are a leader and hopefully what we do will attract more other players to just follow our route in exactly the identical way or in a similar way. And this is our path. And how do we define this? What will we underwrite going forward? Uh, what will we not? Uh, it is on a normative basis where we ourselves ask us, what will the transformation in the end need to bring as a change? Uh, and now I'm very blunt. Uh, it doesn't require more reporting because if all the reporting brings more reports, but the emissions globally carry on increasing as they have been year after year after year up to date, then what's the sense? Uh, if all our, our communiques and all our net zero ambitions are nice, but emissions globally carry on increasing as they have been doing for years now up to date, what's the case? So what needs to happen is 
fossil energy production and consumption uh, needs to get down rapidly and it needs to be replaced by renewable. And we need carbon removal. I could explain it, it would take too long. So we focus on, we do everything we can to assess those risks associated to the new technologies to enable them happening. Uh, that's, the, that's the biggest contribution that we can make. And the second one is, yes, step by step, uh, we will say goodbye to those uh, fossil energy sources where we think they wouldn't fit into the Paris 2050 master plan any longer, starting with coal. And we have defined the percentages by, by how much this will decrease, and we have it measurable uh, at our end. Hopefully, some will follow. But all that said, I don't want all of you to misunderstand me that I'm saying that's the solution for the global climate change challenge. It's not. We will need governments in addition and massively. Thank you so much. Mark, over to you on the investment side. What is your view in terms of what role you can play to actually move the dial? Yeah, I think um, actually the underwriting and the investment side of insurers uh, is coming together. Uh, so, so we have publicly committed to, to not invest, to not underwrite uh, coal. Um, production companies unless they've signed up to net zero with clear science-based targets agreed. So actually that, that's the kind of pressure you can put on corporates. Uh, and I think that's the way it's going to go going forward, that the investment and the underwriting will be very, very aligned. Uh, to give you an example on the investment side, uh, we have written to the top 30 carbon emitters globally. So that's the oil and gas extractors. Uh, and we have told them if they don't sign up to net zero, uh, and science-based targets, uh, we've given them two to three years, uh, then we will divest from our holdings. Uh, and, uh, and we're getting a really good response um, from um, quite, a, quite a majority of those top 30 uh, emitters. So, you know, that's a great example. And if underwriting in the end follows that too, then actually we will be able to, um, you know, at, uh, exert our pressure across multiple fronts on these corporates. Because we, look, we, we want to finance the transition and we want to underwrite the transition. That's our role here as uh, insurers on the assets and on uh, the underwriting side. I, I, think I, pro Mark, I probably should just yeah. answer the, the one year horizon point because that's yes, quite please. easy. Mm -hmm. uh, the one year horizon is really just the capital where we look at capital. Uh, you'll be pleased to hear that our investment horizon is, is very long term on all our assets. We invest 30 years meet liabilities so we don't have a one-year horizon on on our asset strategies that's just the way we look at capital it, it does impact a little bit but but it's not how we do things it's all very very long term thank you so much for that let me take a comment that peter brought and i think that's pretty novel in terms of you know how do we bring key clusters together because you know we're talking about incremental change right now and earlier on from carlotta's and panels, ones, you know, numbers and statistics, we need revolutions, technological and institutional and financial revolutions to make this uh, major transformation to happen. And then Peter uh, brought the whole idea that, you know, instead of thinking individual companies, we really need to think about the value chain of an industry, which actually is changing, you know, given new technologies. And also we need to think supply chains. So coming back to you, Mark, to what extent, and I don't want to put you in a position, but in your opinion, to what extent that transformation in the financial sector that John Colas was talking about, and I've had a chat with you uh, through the work that you're doing, for example, with G7 and G20, should really be driven by looking holistically as at industry value chains as opposed to companies in one sector or another. How is that conversation going and what do we need to do to think along those ways uh, at individual industry level or in the financial sector altogether? Um, uh, no, it's a, it's a great question. I think um, the one thing I will um, respond here is uh, we've heard uh, John Carlotta earlier 
uh, mentioned the need for a, an overhaul of the whole glo global financial architecture because uh, it wasn't built with sustainability in mind. And, and, and that's the blueprint we put forward for an international platform for climate finance, uh, which is actually to, to sit across a, a body accountable to assist governments pull together and monitor a global transition plan and to sit in between developed and developing economies, um, which, you, you know, this is the type of, of body that we, we've been asking for as a finance sector to, to help um, oversee, um, to coalesce governments, et cetera. So, you know, I would like to take uh, this opportunity to, to warmly welcome the offer of the OECD Secretary General uh, to the G20 finance ministers to provide the technical expertise of the OECD in support of carbon pricing. You know, that could be a major step in the direction that the whole finance sector needs uh, to create a, um, a platform for overseeing a global transition, which I think addresses uh, the real question that you're, you're asking me there. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, Peter, let me come back to you. Uh, we've heard um, from the insurance industry on both sides of the balance sheet, the, you know, the fact that, you know, they started this work long time ago and, and they're looking at both adaptation and mitigation. But what are your thoughts? I mean, you brought the idea of looking at these issues from a whole industry value chain. How can we pull that together? How can we build the scale? How can we, uh, you know, leverage this kind of engagement? Where do we start? We don't have time. That's That's the big message that... I think Patricia gave us, and we all know, and we know it's not about COP26. How should we move forward to expedite and make sure we actually make this decade the decade of action? Well, I, let me answer in, uh, in I guess, uh, three ways. One is um, on, on the topic of adaptation, the conversation and uh, responding to what Joachim said earlier. There is the Global Center for Adaptation it has been formed, uh, it's been set up about two years ago. Uh, former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon is chairman uh, and quite some dignitaries are around. Uh, that was the meeting I was in where uh, multi-billions of public private financing aimed at adaptation were being discussed. And that's where I would anticipate or expect the, the, the global insurance industry and maybe through the Geneva Association to become a partner. So I'll be very happy to introduce you there and, and, and see if there's a partnership that the industry can build and, and become a voice in. <clears throat> Secondly, in my organization, we're doing a lot of work with the corporates around you know, the energy transition and all the other big moves that the world needs. And one of the big <clears throat> plays that we have is we need to reinvent capitalism. And from a corporate point of view means we need to standardize ESG, make it mandatory. We need to adapt to TCFD, the, the, the whole governance framework. And eventually we need to have a conversation with investors about how will better sustainability performance lead to a lower cost of capital for investors. The element that I've never ever focused on and, and picking up to some of the things that were said in this panel is how could actually the insurance industry and what you do and don't underwrite or which risks you do or do not accept play a role in that transition. So anyone on this panel or, or even again, the Geneva Association who has a bright ID, we should really link up our, our conversation because that's a pretty immediate response that we can mobilize across hundreds of companies that are already working on the transition to give them even more of an incentive. So I think those type of conversations we need to now have, because if we connect two platforms that can really bring scale, that will accelerate transition for companies involved in them. Excellent, thank you so much. And I would say the same sentiments are resonated through for example, World Economic uh, Forum platforms. I mean, clearly uh, the insurance industry through its leadership has risen up to setting up key alliances through uh, net zero alliances for asset managers and net zero alliances of, of insurers. But certainly these conversations need to turn into action through the collective uh, of discussions. Thank you very much for that. 
Um, now, uh, Joachim, I want to come back to you and uh, maybe you can lay out a little bit as to, uh, you know, Leo Martinez in his um, uh, intervention laid out six uh, proposed suggestions for the insurance industry. And in fact, there has been a call to invite insurance industry for discussions with governments uh, around these type of discussions. If, how would you respond to, to particularly when he said, you know, as we look at the transitioning, how is the insurance industry itself going to transition and innovate uh, and, and, and you know, revolutionize in a way, going back to Carlotta's point, uh, when it comes to uh, you know, the scale of innovation in its underwriting that's needed uh, for the transitioning. So let's go beyond uh, the, uh, you know, the energy and alternatives as we've known it, solar and wind and uh, carbon capture and think about the whole economy. What is ahead of insurance industry and how does it look um, you know, looking 10, 10 years from now, how has industry uh, innovated itself? Yeah, there is a couple of different ways how we could look at this question. So one is, what's the natural role and what's the um, socioeconomic relevance of insurance? It's taking risk. It's taking risk away from its insurers, whether uh, private people or corporates. That's what we have been doing. Uh, now, what do we do? What are we good as insurance? What the insurers are not good at, we diversify these risks across the industries, across the insurers, and we make it insurable. And we do that over time. So that is, if you like, our purpose of, of, of being in the world. So far, so good for all the type of risks that uh, we understand well. What about risks that are related to that are new, related to new technologies, or just popping up for the first time, where no history, where no track record exists? Here, I think it is absolutely an obligation of all reinsurers and insurers that we engage in assessing those risks and making them insurable as far as possible, as broadly as possible. Uh, and of course, in uh, uh, as attractive as possible, but that is what competition is going to bring, right? Um, so, and this is working, uh, Maria. I would say, where new risks or new technologies do have markets that that do exist. What happens is that insurers or reinsurers they directly get involved with the OEMs that are facing those risks, understand them, create solutions that mitigate the risk at the insured side and price for it. And that's how the markets start getting and then competition over time will bring the margins down. That's how it's been working. What if there is no market? Uh, frankly, in the first panel, we talked about market failure. Um, I think there we need stimulus, artificial stimulus by carbon price, that's one. And the other one is where governments need to involve themselves or of working out a master plan together with the industries. That will be my answer. Thank you so much. I just realized that some of our audience are actually submitting their questions through the chat as opposed to Q&A. So let me come back and, and look at some of the questions. And, and this is for any of you, uh, maybe Denise, you want to address this one or anybody in, on the panel. What is the role of nuclear in our transition and providing energy security, uh, you know, as, as we sort of head to 2050? Is that room for nuclear given the risks that are associated with it? Anybody would like to take that question, both from investment, underwriting and Denise, uh, please, go ahead. I'm happy to kick off, and I'm sure that um, other colleagues on the panel can bring this more to home in terms of insurance sense. But, but, but for us, with a, a you know sort of engineering as an engineering business, we see the need for a, a, an energy mix for some time to come. Um, what I think is really important, certainly in the realms of 
do we need new nuclear? Um, I, the, the question's not clear whether um, it's like coal, coal, we should be trying to transition out as quickly as possible or whether we want more new nuclear. Um, but I, I think either way, really, we need to make sure we have very, very responsible plans for disposal. I think historically, we've, we've not thought through the whole life cycle of those um, major investments and we've not thought about the decommissioning aspect. Uh, so, so I think we will need an energy mix for some time to come. But I think within that mix, certainly in relation to nuclear, we need to think long and hard about the decommissioning period. Thank you so much. Joachim, I think you wanted to make a comment, please. Yeah, I would, I, I would add the following comments. Uh, just from a pure carbon perspective or emissions perspective, uh, nuclear technology is clean. So in this sense, we should like it. I, I'd like to add one thing. I dislike it for one reason that there is a tail risk, another environmental risk, which is the nuclear waste, uh, which is unresolved, if we are honest. For, for that reason, I dislike it, but for the pure carbon emissions perspective, uh, we should embrace it. Uh, but even then, and France would of course embrace it more than other countries, but even then, nuclear technology is not gonna be uh, part of a big solution to uh, energy transition. And the reason why is it takes decades uh, to develop new nuclear plants and to deploy them worldwide, decades. By 2050, even if you want it, uh, it will be uh, too late. However, the nuclear energies that we have today, we shouldn't stop them operating uh, and replace them by renewable energy that isn't even existent uh, yet. So for the time being, we should use what we have, but it's not a long-term solution. Thank you. Mark, can I ask you a point on this question? And, and it's always about, um, and I think something that Joachim said earlier that, you know, are we getting stuck in analysis, paralysis and reporting rather than really focusing on the real action of transitioning and investing in transitioning. So coming back to this whole issue of nuclear and coming back to what Peter was saying around how companies need to embrace a more integrated business model that includes decarbonization and more of a sustainable business model from an investment point of view. Could you elaborate a little bit, how are these choices going into the investment decisions and to what extent as you invest, uh, you consider a more holistic view as opposed to just, you know, the silo thinking of decarbonization uh, versus not? Yeah, how so is that? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the impact you now make with your investments is equally important as the financial returns. Um, so that, that's the philosophy we have. Our investment philosophy very much is to finance the transition. So we will buy, buy brown, we will hold brown, we will help make it green, and then we will look to sell it. We think that's the best return um, we can get for all our customers, our shareholders, and we will make a difference uh, to the world as well. So that's, that's how we think. Um, let's apply that to nuclear for a second. Uh, very long-term returns, potential. Uh, we need a lot of government support uh, with, with some of the, the key risks involved. Uh, but I think the, the government hasn't made a decision in the UK whether nuclear is ESG friendly or not. I think the government needs to, to, to actually finish their analysis and, and report on that. Um, it's green, as we just heard, from a, from a carbon um, uh, emittance. Um, but it has huge reputational risk associated with it. So uh, the G of ESG and the S um, you know, do people want a nuclear power station uh, anywhere near where they live? Um, you know, these are huge ESG issues for us to, to, to address. So on nuclear, we we're, we're, we have a watching brief. That's it. We're, we're, there's nothing to invest in right now. Um, it could be a transition asset in some senses. Um, as I said, there is demand, but it takes so long to build one that it, that it isn't as good as some of the other areas. So um, you know, hopefully that explains how we would look at it with the full ESG and financial return all together when we make an investment decision. Excellent. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we are nearly at the end of this session. So we will have just time for a one sentence closing remark. But there is a really great 
question uh, posed by the audience, and I want to use that to sort of get your final concrete points. And, and the question is, how do we break this catch-22 of the difficulty to price and the risk and you know the, the pricing of the new risk to really get this going? And we know that creation of a market is an issue, but may I ask your concrete thoughts, a sort of call for action of the clear partnerships and actions that needs to happen now, as opposed to 10 years from now, to help us start paving the way and what can we do uh, as an industry or as connection to corporates and engineering. So let me start with um, Peter, uh, your final uh, thoughts. I would really like the, the insurance industry to really pull together with very clear messages on what is the cost of inaction, because it's, it's the business of the insurance industry to price risks. And we all say that the cost of action nowadays is lower than the cost of inaction. I'm looking at you to give me the numbers to support that. Excellent. And by the way, Peter, we're going to call on you on the collaboration of Geneva Association and the World Business Council. Uh, Denise, I'm coming to you. Your final thoughts. What partnerships, what actions as we move forward? Uh, thanks very much. I mean, just, just to reiterate, I think focus and alignment is key, isn't it? So the, the catch 22 will only be unlocked if we've got really good clarity about what it is we're all trying to achieve and align on the time frame for doing that. And at the moment, I don't think either of those two critical elements are completely clear. Um, so I think we should prioritise those multi-stakeholder strategic partnerships that enable and incentivize scaling up the technological innovation and commercialization, because we've got to create that environment that unlocks implementation, you know, say concrete action again. Um, and I think, as I said earlier, but just want to reiterate, the private sector's got to embrace ways of working where policy might pivot. And we've got to fail fast at times. And that's something which we've not had to do before. But the scale and the nature of the change we have to go through, I mean, we've really got to think hard about how to do that better. Thank you. Mark, over to you. Um, well, why don't I bring uh, Denise's comments to life? So I think we, we need government policy to, to play a role in encouraging development of hydrogen, uh, whether it's green or blue technologies. And multiple industries are going to need, need that support. Uh, and as long-term investors, we need to collaborate with the corporates that we invest into uh, and to encourage them to spend more in long-term research and development. We want them to be bolder, to have more ambition on the required capex that's needed, and that will require the government intervention as well. So that sort of three-way collaboration uh, finances, the corporates who need to do the R&D and the government subsidies uh, and support that will be required. Great, thank you. And Joachim? Your last remarks? Uh, my last remarks is we need a carbon price and uh, we need a master plan uh, for every country involving governments and, uh, and the industry leaders across. And I think we should call for this urgently and very loudly everywhere in the world. If you allow me, Peter had a question, what's the cost of inactivity? I can tell you what the losses from weather related uh, events is per year. I mean, that's not the increase beyond one and a half or two degrees. It's the total cost worldwide. It's 200 billion, either US or Euro, doesn't matter that much. And that is rising. Just that you have an indication and how that compared per annum huh, every year. Uh, and that's, uh, that compares then to the 1.3 trillion of uh, estimated investors needed by 2030 into the uh, energy transformation. And it would be ridiculous that we tolerated sort of this cost from losses, uh, but not the cost from investing into net zero. So I'm with Peter. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Peter, Mark, Denise, and Joachim. We are almost uh, over uh, with our time. So let me just thank everybody for your participation and pass this to Yoshi Kawai, uh, Chair of OECD Insurance and Private Pension Committee and Jad Aris, Managing Director of the Geneva Association, uh, to say a few words of closing remarks, and I thank you all. Over to you, Yoshi. Thank you, Marianne. Uh, can you hear me? Very well. 
a good thank you. So dear speakers, dear participants, I'd like to thank everybody for their valuable contributions Oops. For, the, for, for today's. And today's discussion has shown the urgency of the need to transition to resilient net zero economy and the critical role to be played by our industry, technology, and innovation. As we discussed in the last uh, session, no, there is no choice that we don't take any action. We have to take action now. The lively discussion today will feed into the work of our, our committee, OECD's Insurance and Private Pension Committee, where I chair and bring together high-level insurance sector government officials, policymakers, and regulators from around the world. As discussed today, uh, it is essential to cooperate between the public sector and the private sector in this important field. And the OECD, uh, particularly our committee, is very much uh, in charge of public-private partnership. For example, underwriting climate change, definitely we need public-private partnership. And this is one of the key area that we work together with the industry and naturally our high government officials. So I'd like to thank the Geneva Association for having agreed to co-organize this event, make this point a joint event as a trigger. We are excited to enhance cooperation between OECD and the Geneva Association. And with personal remark, thanks to this event, I'm very happy to have reconnected today, Charles, Joachim, Nagano-san, Jad, Marian, Stephanie, all my Geneva Association friends. I'd like also like to thank my OECD colleagues, Tim and Lee to make this event successful. So now I turn to the floor over to Jad for his final remark. Thank you. Thank you, Yoshi, for your kind words. Dear conference participants, um, uh, thank you for attending this, um, this event. I would like to thank warmly the OECD, in particular Deputy Secretary General Schlagenhauf and you, Yoshi, for addressing us today. Um, we are deeply grateful to Patricia Espinoza uh, for having also taken the time to uh, share a few thoughts with us in spite of what is certainly a very heavy agenda before COP26. And I'm very grateful to three of the board members of the Geneva Association, Charles Grindemore, CEO of Intact, um, um, uh, Nagano-san, uh, Chairman of um, Tokyo Marine, as well as Joachim Venning, uh, Chairman of the Management Board of Munich Re, for having uh, talked to us today. This conference has been remarkable in bringing together leaders from different sectors, from different backgrounds, um, from insurance and finance to engineering, to government, academic, multilateral organizations, UN and OECD, as well as very important platforms such as the World Economic Forum and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Um, this really echoes the message of Patricia Espinoza at the beginning of this conference, which is that climate change will not be addressed by one country or one economic sector or one type of stakeholders, but really through um, multi-stakeholder cooperation uh, of the whole civil society. Today, we zoomed on the role of insurers, um, exploring how they can mobilize all their uh, activities, all their skills, their whole balance sheet on the asset side, on the liability side, uh, to support the transition to net zero. And I cannot think of a better example, of a better illustration of the insurance industry's purpose, uh, which is to protect people, businesses, economies, societies, and ultimately the world, uh, to protect them against risks and to highlight um, that it can be a force for good, as manifested behind me, insurance for a better world. With this, I leave you. Thank you for having shared these moments with us, and we hope to reconnect soon. Goodbye. <laughs>